Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I think you guys have been sitting in the same place for a long time, I think. So stand up. Hurry up and do it. Stretch a little bit. It's cold. You need the blood to flow in your body. It's cold for you. It's not cold for me. I'm from America. All right. Good. Have a seat. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين رب العالمين رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I will uh, first give everybody here a disclaimer I got off a plane maybe three hours ago so or three four hours ago so if I don't make any sense at all. Blame Qatar Airways. Um, but inshallah ta'ala, I'll try to be as coherent as I possibly can be. Um, the subject tonight is very, very important and very dear to all of our hearts. It's the honor of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I want to start with a difficult beginning. And that is that we live in a time, uh, the postmodern age, where we have to understand how not just what's happening with the deen of Islam, but what's happening with human beings in general. Uh, larger trends in human thought. And we have to understand some aspects of that and how they impact Muslims. Because what impacts the entire population of the world in some ways, because of the advent of media and social media and the internet and other things and the, the forms of entertainment that are now accessible, it impacts every human being, whether they're religious or not, Muslim or not, Christian or not, Jewish or not. There are some common effects that all of us experience. And then within that sphere, we have to talk about how it affects Muslims. So one of the things I want to talk to you about is the difference between pre-modern cultures and post-modern cultures. Pre-modern cultures in every single culture, whether you looked at the Indian civilization, or you looked at the Chinese, or you looked at the Persians, or you looked at the Africans, or even the Europeans. Uh, Pre-modern cultures, there were certain things that were considered very respectable. Certain things you never make a joke about. Certain things you never insult. And these are part of the dignity of those people. They are sacred monuments, or they are sacred stories, or they are sacred individuals or heroes of nations that you do just do not poke fun at. They're not an object of ridicule at all, ever. And postmodern society, the thing that is respected more than anything else, as a matter of fact, uh, is entertainment. You know, one of the most interesting things to study nowadays are the most trending YouTube videos and the most downloaded or the most viral videos that go on the internet and most of them have to do with the most absurd, ridiculous, senseless things. And that's actually a pretty good indication that human beings are more interested now in having a good laugh than anything else. And so, of course, the people in entertainment media understand this. They understand that if you can get people to laugh, then it's going to sell. But we also have to understand comedy and these, the entertainment media, the purpose of it is actually not entertainment. Billions of dollars are put into that industry because they know they're going to make money off of your laugh. They're going to make money off of your, you, know, you being entertained. So there are very smart you know, academic intellectuals and executives that put a lot of hours and research into putting together movies and film and, and, you know, and, and comic strips and things like that. This is actually, there's an entire machinery behind this. It's not some accident how this stuff comes up. Now, what's happened in postmodern society, one of its most challenging uh, uh, complexities, is that we have a time now where everything can be made fun of. Everything can be made fun of. There is nothing left that you cannot make fun of. And I won't give you the worst examples. I'll start with simple examples. I think many of you, if you raise your hand if you've heard of this before. If you haven't, just make, say alhamdulillah or make istighfar. Sesame Street, anybody? Sesame Street? It's okay. Those of you who don't raise your hand, raise your hand in your heart. It's okay. I know you watched it. So you know. Uh, so, you know, in Sesame Street, the, you know, when I used to watch it when I was a kid, I remember it. And now, you know, I've seen some recent episodes, and one of the things they commonly do is they take a historical figure, and Elmo will dress like George Washington or Napoleon or something, and they'll make fun of historical figures. Or they'll do parodies of classical music or th and things like that. Why? Because everything historical, everything sacred, somehow or the other, 
has to be made fun of. In the United States, which is obviously the world leader in uh, global entertainment, the movie industry, Hollywood, and you know, the television industry, the TV shows that are spreading worldwide, uh, and have been doing so for, you know, it's been the biggest American export for so long, You've had shows like The Simpsons or Family Guy, and those of you who know what I'm talking about, just make istighfar in your heart. I know you've seen it. Right? And these are shows in which making fun of God is common. You, just, you depict God as you know, the Christian version of this old man with a beard, Ma'adullah, and they make fun of it. Or they make fun of Jesus all the time. They've been making fun of Jesus since the 80s and 90s. It's been common in, in, uh, you know, in, in, in cartoons and satire for a very, very long time. My first argument today is as Muslims, we should be as offended when any messenger of Allah is insulted or made fun of as we are when the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is offended. When he is insulted or when Isa alayhi salam is insulted or when Musa alayhi salam is insulted, when any of the messengers of Allah are insulted, we are insulted. You know, the Qur'an makes us declare لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِنْ رُسُلِهِ We don't make distinction between any one of those messengers. وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ Allah sends His salam and His salutation and through Him we do to all the people who were given a message. All the ones that were sent. So we have to, you know, I see that Muslims get extremely upset. We get uh, worldwide, in America included, Canada included, you know, the West included. We get very, very upset when something is said about Rasulullah or a cartoon is made about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam or a video is made. This is not something new, by the way. They did something recently, the Charlie Hebdo thing, we, we all know about that. But there was a YouTube video before then because of which so many countries banned YouTube. Like Pakistan, that's the solution, ban YouTube, and then somehow the people will respect the Prophet again, والسلام, Oh, here's another solution Muslims have come up with. If you come out on the street and flip a bunch of cars over, somehow that will be love of Allah's Messenger. والسلام, that's what we've done. You know, and we've, we've become reactionary. And you know what, the people behind this, they understand that. So they give it some time, and they do another one, and they give it some time, and they do another one, and they give it some time, and they do another one. They want it because they know they can get a reaction out of us. And I'm telling you, on the one hand, even though I'm going to talk to you about the Qur'an in a second, we have to understand the games that are being played with Muslims. We have to be smart about this. We have to understand the language of these people and what motivates them. At the end of the day, all they want to do is make money. That's all they want to do. That's their religion. That's what they worship is the bottom line. They want to make sensation out of this, and the more Muslims will be offended, the more they bring it to the top, the more they can sell the news reports and the news media, the more they can make this trend, the more advertising they get. It is entirely just an economic bit of machinery. And they know we are easy targets, so they go for it. And we're gullible and we fall for it every time, because we don't yet understand how to respond in their language. We haven't understood it yet as a people. I have some thoughts on that, but I'll share that with you later. Now coming to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You know, there are different ways that we can acknowledge the, the great status of the final messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. But in my personal humble opinion, there is no greater praise of Allah's messenger alayhi salatu wasalam than the word of Allah itself. The way Allah describes His Messenger, the way himself, He Himself honors His Messenger والسلام, is unparalleled. No human being will ever even come close to praising Allah's Messenger, to honoring Allah's Messenger والسلام, than Allah Himself. So I want to begin with that. When Allah says, Inna a'tainaka al kawthar I just want you to think, I'm going to go through several examples from the Qur'an, and I, this is usually a four hour lecture that I do, but I know it's cold for you. So I'm going to actually stick to the time. Actually, let me take my watch out and make sure I stick to my time. I'm going to speak to you for 40 minutes. I know, that I, I know that's shorter than what was promised to you, but there, here's why. There are a lot of kids in the audience and they're not dressed warmly. <laughs> they came up to me, can I have a picture, the little guys? But they weren't wearing a jacket, so I'm worried about them. There's a couple of kids that dressed warmly, mashallah. So, you know, I, I, I don't want you to be out and get sick. So that's why I'm going to cut it as short as I possibly can and just share some selections with you, inshaAllah ta'ala. And the first of them is, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loses a child. He loses a child. It is one of the worst experiences a human being can have. I have six kids. I can't imagine what that would be like. You know, sometimes you get nightmares. When you sleep, you get nightmares of one of your family members getting hurt. 
or something bad happening and you wake up crying, a grown man wakes up crying because the thought of it we can't bear. And if my wife sees me wake up crying and says, what happened, what happened? Did you see something? I, 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 I can't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. It's too difficult to even talk about, to bring to your mouth. That's, that's too difficult. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam experiences the death of a baby. One he loves dearly. And on, if that's not painful enough, his, his vicious uncle next door is celebrating the death of a child. Enemies don't even do that. People who hate you will not love the fact that a child in your family died. And this is his family, Abu Lahab is family. And he's celebrating the death of this baby. Radiallahu anhu. This kind of pain, and what does Allah do to the Messenger Inna We have given you no doubt about it. We have granted to you the unimaginable abundance. Kawthar is different from Kathir, it's Mubalagha. And it's an unusual form of Mubalagha, of hyperbole in Arabic, that suggests greatness like no other. At a time where he just lost something, Allah is telling him he has gained something that can't even be compared. Don't think so much about what you have lost. Let me tell you what you have gained. This is what the Rasul is told Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what he has been given, the good that he has been given, the status that he has been given Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Qur'an that he has been given, nothing ever that human beings will get before him or after him, nothing will ever even come close. This is al kawthar this is Al-Kawthar, including what is, you know, Al-Hawd fil Jannah, but beyond it, because the, the, the language is open, at tawassu fil Ma'na, it's open. So that's what I wanted to start with. The second example that I want to give you is, when Allah tells us to do something in the Qur'an, He gives us commands, He just tells us to do it. Aqimu salawa, finish it for me. Aqimu salawa, atu zakah, thank you for sleeping, very good. Aqimu salawa, atu zakah, establish prayer. Give zakat. Easy. That's a command. If he wants us to not do something, he'll just tell us to not do it. لا تقرب الزنا. لا تقرب الفواح. He'll just tell us straightforward. Don't do this. Don't even go near this. You know. Don't eat that. He'll just tell it very directly. But in this one command, and that command is, Muslims, believers, you need to send salutations and you need to send your respects and prayers upon the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's a command that's an amr from Allah but he didn't just issue the command which he could he says inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuha alladhina amanu sallu sallu alayhi wa sallimu tasliman he could just say ya ayyuha alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallu ala rasulillah wa sallimu tasliman we know every time we hear his name we say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but he that wasn't enough to Allah in his perfect Quran that was not enough he says no doubt about it it is Allah himself and his angels and by the way the population of angels much bigger than the population of human beings much much bigger than the population of human beings and all of those angels not one angel is the exception all of them are sending salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then he says, "Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu sallu alayhi." Those of you who have iman, pray upon him, send salawat upon him. Now we are when we say when we say these salawat upon uh, the Messenger wasalam, we are not only doing an act of ibadah; we are actually fulfilling a sunnah of Allah Himself. Allah Himself does what He's asking you to do, sallu alayhi. It's an incredible honor. It's an incredible act. Like there is no other command in the Qur'an that even comes close in its, in its position than this. And it's associated directly with our Messenger wasallam. I was going to share with you inshaAllah ta'ala a, a long hadith narration. But I will, I'll, I'll skip to, and you know what, I don't care, I will share it with you. <laughs> it's your cold anyway. It's not like you can feel your hands anymore. So just enjoy the ride. So here's what I want to share with you. First, a, a small story. When you call someone by their name, that's not supposed to be an insult. If you call me Norman, I'm going to say, excuse me? That's my name. That's what you're supposed to call me. Now, of course, this doesn't always work because, you know, in, in, if you're married, then you, I don't know what your wife calls you, but usually she doesn't call you your name. Right? So she'll say, Vo, G. Or some, some other pronoun <coughs> or something. 
you know? But if your wife calls you by your name, no man, no, I get scared, like, I don't know. Something really bad is gonna be happening <laughs> if she says my name, you know? Or your mother, your mother can call you whatever name she wants, she can make up a name for you. She can do so whatever, you, she can, you know, just come here, you monkey, or whatever. But you know what? If she calls you by your name, Norman, I mean, you know what that means? It's something really serious. It's something serious. But generally, for outsiders, for out, not within the family, for outsiders, when they call your name, then that's how they're supposed to call you. It's, there's nothing offensive about that. And of course, when Allah Azza wa Jal speaks to prophets in the Quran, and not only prophets in the Quran, when He speaks to them, He calls them by their name. Ya Adam, uskun anta wa al jannah. He, he said, Adam, you and your spouse go live in Jannah, settle in Jannah. Simple. Ya Ibrahim. Nadaynahu an ya Ibrahim. Qad sadaqta ru'ya. Ibrahim, you fulfilled the promise. He called him by his name. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ya Ibrahim. Simple. Ya Musa. Innani an Allah. Musa, I am no doubt Allah when he spoke to him on the mountain. Ya Isa, inni mutawafika wa rafi'uka ilayya. Isa, I'm going to be taking you, elevating you towards me. Ya Isa. So he calls people by their name, even Dawood alayhi salam, Ya Dawood, inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. Dawood, we have made you someone who will be a khalifa on the earth. You have in the Quran multiple prophets and they are called, and what's the Arabic word for calling someone? Ya. Ya Dawood, Ya Adam, Ya Ibrahim, right? you have, Ya Isa, you have these cases, Ya Maryam even, you know? And when the angel spoke to her, or Ya Dhal Qarnayn, imma an tu'adhib wa imma an tattakhitha fihim husna, no problem. What you don't have, what you don't have in the Qur'an is Ya Muhammad. You don't have it, it doesn't exist. And it's not like the Prophet ﷺ is not addressed. As a matter of fact, he is addressed. Ya ayyuhal Nabi, Ya ayyuhal Rasul, Ya ayyuhal Muzammil, Ya ayyuhal Muddathir. Never directly by his name. There is a special status given to Rasulullah ﷺ that Allah does not consider just calling him by his name. He will always call him by a title or a loving name. Unlike any other prophet, with every other prophet, he would call them by their name ﷺ. But with our messenger ﷺ, he'll call him by a special title every time. Every time. And you know what? On the, on the flip side, even the word Muhammad, it's such a beautiful name. Muhammad is what's considered an ism maf'ul. I know that sounds technical, I'll make it simple in a second. It's an ism maf'ul from the taf'il pattern of the Arabic language. What that suggests is someone who is praised over and over again, continually over a long period of time. That is what the name Muhammad itself means. Someone who is praised, someone who is appreciated over a long period of time, continuously and repeatedly. Now, when you call someone Muhammad, therefore, then you're actually honoring them anyway. Just even using that word is honoring someone. This is why so many people in the world, they name their child Muhammad. I know, I know a family have nine sons, all nine sons are named Muhammad, it's very confusing. But you know, <laughs> but the, the love of Rasul is so strong that you know, they just use it. And as a matter of fact, in the Prophet's life itself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some people come, these are, these are new Muslims, these are Bedouins, they haven't been cultured, they haven't been given any tarbiyah yet, they don't know the, the manners of dealing with the Prophet So they come to his apartment, and his apartment used to be very little, very tiny. And they stand right outside, and they say, Ya Muhammad, ukhruj alayna. Muhammad, come out, we gotta talk to you. Now they don't mean any disrespect, they just, you know, like, I, I like to think of them, they're like Texans. You know, they're just rough around the edges. They just do what they do, they, they're, they're not much about the city life, you know. So they just say, Muhammad, come out. They don't say, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabi Allah, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi. They say, Muhammad, Ukhruj Alayna. Ya Muhammad, Ukhruj Alayna. Now, let's take a step back before I finish this story. Abu Bakr as Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala, and his best friend, yes or no? His best friend. He never says, My best friend said. When he quotes a hadith, he never says, Qala Siddiqi, Qala Hamimi, Qala Khalil. No? Qala Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His wife never says, my husband said. She never says that. What does she say? Qalat qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His uncle never says, my nephew said. He always says, qala Rasulullah. No, they don't even say qala Muhammad. They say qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His nephew will never say qala ammi. My uncle said. Never. Every time he'll speak, he'll say qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can you understand what that means? 
He has these relationships like you and I have relationships. He's husband to someone. He's uncle to someone. He's nephew to someone. He's father to someone. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha never says, my father said. Even she says, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But in all of these relationships, my, my children don't call me Norman. They call me Abba. My, my dad doesn't call me Norman. He says, oi. <laughs> when you have a relationship, Every relationship, you don't use formality, right? You don't, you're not formal in your everyday relationships. You know, my, my friends don't call me Norman. They're like, hey, hey, yo. That's what they call me. That's my name, hey, yo. You know? So now, it's hard. You have to understand these Sahaba, unlike us, to you and me, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is actually a constitution. He's not a person anymore in front of us. He's actually encapsulated in books of the seerah. He's encapsulated in ayat of the Qur'an. He's encapsulated in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim and, you know, Tirmidhi ibn Majah. He's cal- it's, these, it's this entire constitution in front of us. He's not just a person, he's an entire legacy. He's so much larger than life to us, alayhi salatu wasalam. But at the time when he was there, he was somebody's uncle, he was somebody's nephew, he was somebody's best friend, he was somebody's husband, he was somebody's neighbor. And yet those people, even though they have known him for 40 years, and for 40 years they didn't call him Rasulullah, or no special terms. No special terms. But once Iman hit them, once La ilaha illallah came in their hearts, then they could not use the words that just come naturally. Like my husband, before she can even think he's my husband, the first thought that comes in her head, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and radiallahu ta'ala anhunna, ummahatul mu'mineen, all of them, is this is Rasulullah. This is Rasulullah. This is impossible for any of us. It is impossible. I am married to my wife and you know, I like to teach Arabic. That's what I like to do. And my wife happens to be someone who likes to learn Arabic. But the last person in the known universe that she will learn Arabic from is me. She can't do it. She's genetically incapable of learning Arabic from me. We've tried. It gives her allergic reactions. She used to be in my class. And she quit after a, little, a short while. And the entire time she was in my class, she was extremely angry with me. And that's because if I'm her teacher, then I'm always right and she's always wrong. Because <laughs> if she answers a question incorrectly, I have my job as a teacher is to correct her and tell her, no, actually it's this way, this way. Right? And she has to, now I'm in this position where I'm always going to be right. And by the way, in marriage, that don't work. <laughs> Let me tell you. If I, if she, I was actually afraid to, if she raised her hand to answer a question, I used to be like, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. Just check bookings at the local hotels or something. Because she can't do it. She can't think of me as teacher first and husband second. She's only programmed to think of me as what first? Husband first. And if she thinks of me as husband first, then obviously I'm always wrong. But as a teacher, I'm supposed to be always right. (laughs) You understand? It's very difficult to make that switch. You know? The same thing with your parents. Your parent to your parents, you're gonna be an idiot the rest of your life. It doesn't matter if you're the biggest scholar in the world or the biggest, you know, you know, speaker or whatever else you're going to be in just a monkey to your parents. And that's it's never going to change. They will never see you as a sheikh first, or a speaker first, or a, a doctor first, or an engineer first. They can. They see the guy, they see the kid that they change diapers of. That's what they see. But these sahaba, these elders, when they see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who they have known their entire life, once iman comes, they no longer see their nephew. They no longer see a husband. They no longer see a friend. They, this, all of that is second. He's Rasulullah first. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُطِعُوكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَلِتُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمْ Al-Iman. Look at the ayah. It began with, you have to know Rasulullah. You had better know that in your company is none other than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And in the same ayah, it's not even a separate ayah. In the same ayah, he says, حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِمَانِ زَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ He beautified, he made Iman beloved to you. And he beautified it inside of your hearts. 
In other words, if you have Iman in your heart, then you have this unusual, unnatural love and respect for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By the way, it's easy for you to respect the Shaykh or to respect this, it's easy for you. Easy, because all you know is YouTube videos. That's all you know is like Facebook. You don't know anything else about our personal lives. But you know what? My family, they know what I'm really like. And that's why they're never impressed. You understand? They know. My close friends, they know. They're like, yeah, this guy. <laughs> you know? So you know what? And you know, even my own, my, my siblings, my sister comes to my lecture. She tells me why she comes to my lectures. She goes, I, I sometimes I have a hard time sleeping. That's why I come to your lectures. I get some of the best sleep of my life as soon as you say Alhamdulillah it's amazing you know it never fails so you know what the people close to us are the least impressed with us the people far away from us are the most impressed with us in the case of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this will never happen again the, the people that are closest to him are the most impressed with him the people that know his inside out life inside and out are the people who love and honor him more than anybody else Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it's incredible it is absolutely incredible to this day anybody in any position of leadership whether they are the president or they are you know the CEO of a company or whatever when they die then people say I used to be I used to be his taxi driver let me tell you he was a really bad guy and they'll write an expose on him they'll reveal his personal life his bad habits you know what he was really like and in our case, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more we learn about his personal life, the more amazed we become. You're supposed to get the inside scoop to think less of a person. And we get the inside scoop and we even think higher of this man Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now, this narration, that SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, what an incredible, incredible account from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Actually, even before I go to it, I'll give you one more thing. And this is actually, is one of my favorite things in the world. I hope I don't go overboard. I still want to stick to my time limit. You guys doing okay? Is it cold yet? No, it's not cold anymore? Yes, it is. I know, child, I know. Yes, it is. Okay. So the Messenger وسلم, there are two parts of his seerah, one part in Mecca, the early part, and then he, you guys know, migrates to Medina When he was in Mecca, still the, the commandment to pray in the direction of the Qibla, which was Al-Aqsa at the time, Jerusalem, was still there. So the Muslims were still praying in the direction of Jerusalem. But it so happened that you can stand behind the Kaaba and line up Jerusalem. Because you know, when you're in Mecca, you can go on any side. So the Prophet ﷺ used to prefer praying so that he would be facing the Kaaba, the house built by his father Ibrahim ﷺ, and then at the same time be facing Aqsa. This way he could face both houses at the same time. When he moved to Medina, وسلم, that was impossible. Because if you're going to face Mecca, your back will be to Aqsa. If you're going to face Aqsa, your back will be to Mecca. You can't face both at the same time. You understand what I'm saying? He couldn't line them up together anymore. Because now he's in between. He's in between both of those locations. And it really used to hurt his feelings. It used to hurt his feelings that he has to turn his back to the house built by his father Ibrahim alayhi salam. And by the way, our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. Millata abikum Ibrahim. It used to hurt his feelings that he's not showing the due respect to the house built by, the, by his father that he made so much dua on. Now before I finish this story, let me tell you another story. Musa alayhi salam. Anyone know where Musa alayhi salam spoke with Allah for the first time? Where that was? Anybody know? Call it out. Tur, yeah, very good. So he goes up to the mountain, speaks to Allah. Allah gives him a mission and the mission is you have to go challenge Fir'aun. And Musa alayhi salam, as soon as he hears that he has to challenge Fir'aun, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, he actually made a list of issues. Ya Allah, that's a very difficult mission. Inni akhafu an yukadhibun, wa yadiku sadri, wa la yantaliku lisani, 
ولا هم علي ذنب فاخاف ان يقتلون ويضيق صدري ولا ينطلق لساني فارسل الى هارون list of problems one problem is they're going to call me a liar another problem is i have a stutter in my tongue i won't be able to speak clearly firaun is a genius politician Politicians know how to give a speech. I'm not going to be able to debate him. How am I going to debate him with my stutter and my tongue? And also when I get angry, you know when people get angry they can't speak clearly? When I get angry, maybe my tongue won't stop moving because my chest becomes tight. يَضِيقُ صَدْرِي وَلَا يَنْتَلِقُ لِسَانِي So I need backup. Send, send Harun along with me. And they have a crime listed against me. So I'm afraid they won't even give me a chance to speak. They'll just kill me. وَلَهُمْ عَلَيَّ ذَمْبٌ فَأَخَافُ أَنْ يَقْتُلُونَ Meaning Musa alayhi salam made, these are my challenges before I go challenge Fir'aun. And Allah told Musa alayhi salam, kalla, one word, kalla, and it solves all of his problems. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. It's done. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. But what I wanted to highlight was, he had to make a list of all the things that were difficult for him. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, come back to this story. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has to turn his back to what now? The Kaaba, because he still has to face Aqsa, he has to face Jerusalem. And he doesn't complain to Allah. He doesn't tell Allah it's difficult for him. He doesn't say anything. One time it was hurting him so much, he just looked up at the sky. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's all he did. He looked up at the sky. And by the way, every single Muslim in the world, every single Muslim in the world, prays in what direction? The Kaaba. Until the Day of Judgment, we're going to pray in the direction of the Kaaba. That is the house built by Ibrahim salam and then purified by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam so that humanity can worship the one true God. That is the purpose of that house. It is actually built so all humanity can finally come to guidance. This is why wudi al nas Whenever the houses of Allah, house of Allah is talked about, al masjid al haram is talked about, it's always an nas it's Anas, it's not just Alladheena Amanu, because all humanity is supposed to come to Islam. They're meant to come to Islam. They're meant to accept the religion of their father Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now, how many people have prayed since the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam until now? And how many will people will pray from now until the day of judgment? It's uncountable. Uncountable how much worship is going on facing that house. So what is the reason for that Qibla from Aqsa, from Jerusalem, to be changed back to this house. There's lots of reasons, but what's the reason in the Quran? قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَا نُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا We saw your face already turning to the sky. So we are turning you in direction of the Qibla. So you could be happy. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah's reason for changing the Qibla is so the Messenger could be happy Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a direction that he would be pleased with we pray in that direction and Allah's reason is it puts a smile on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's face can you imagine all the worship in the world that will happen correctly until judgment day and all of it boils down to Allah wanting to give happiness to his messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. These are some glimpses of the status of our messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. What I also wanted to highlight for you very very quickly, you know this is a long discussion, I'll give you the short version of it, is when sometimes the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam would do something and Allah would not reveal to him what he should do until after he was done. Allah can reveal Qur'an whenever he wants. And Allah says himself, you know, that he reveals the Qur'an at the right occasion, ala mukthin, ala mukthin, you know. وَقُرْآنًا فَرَقْنَاهُ لِتَقْرَأَهُ عَلَى النَّاسِ عَلَى مُكْثٍ وَنَزَّلْنَاهُ تَنزِيلًا in Surah Al-Isra That he sends Qur'an exactly at the right occasion. But then there are sometimes you'll find stories in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ where people came and he had to make a decision and no ayah came down and he made a decision and after he made a decision ﷺ, then ayat came down telling him, no, you could have made a different decision. The question arises, how come ayat didn't come down before he made the decision? How come they came after he made a decision? 
There's a couple of things here. The first of them is to highlight that Allah Azza wa Jal wants the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam to use his judgment and make his decision. To make a distinction between Allah and his Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, no one can ever correct the Messenger except Allah. No one can correct the Messenger except Allah himself. The Messenger is incredibly much higher than us, but Allah is still the Rabb. He's still Rabbul Arsh al-Azim. Al-Abdu Abdun wa in taraqqa. You know? وَالرَّبُّ رَبُّ وَإِن تَنَزَّلْ That's just what it's gonna be. So it demonstrates that, you know, compare this to the Catholic religion where the Pope is considered infallible. Nobody can correct him, not even God. This is the difference between the Pope and Prophets. Popes can't be corrected. Prophets والسلام, we cannot correct them. We are no one to correct them. But Allah will show us that He is their Rabb. That the Pope isn't divine. That the messengers themselves are just ibadullah. They are also slaves of Allah. But the other important matter here that I wanted to highlight is in one case there were, at the time of Tabuk, there were some, some hypocrites who came to the Prophet ﷺ because it was a draft. Everybody had to join the army. And if you're not going to join, you have to give your excuses. So when, you know, some people came, gave really lame excuses. And one guy said, you know, I, uh, if you're going to go towards Tabuk, then we're going to travel through some villages who have some, they have some really beautiful women. And I'm kind of a player. So I'm not going to be able to help myself. So please excuse me from the military. You know, because you know, players got to play the game. And the Messenger in his genius understood, people who make lame excuses like that are never assets to an army. <laughs> They're going to be more trouble. It's better you stay. So he gave him permission. And then the ayah came, عَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْكَ لِمَا أَذِنْتَ لَهُمْ May Allah, Allah has already pardoned you, why did you give him permission? The ayah did not come before, don't give him permission. Allah let that happen. And then after that said, why did you give him permission? The question is why? Forget about the why, look at how. If I correct you, if you make a mistake, like I have, I, I own an organization, I run an organization, and in my organization there are employees. If my employees make a mistake, I call my employee, I say, this is what you did wrong. It's okay, don't let it happen again, but this was a mistake. I begin with the mistake, and then I say it's okay, or you're fired, or something. <laughs> but I, I mention the mistake when? First. What does Allah do? عَفَى اللَّهُ عَنْكَ لِمَا أَذِنْتَ لَهُمْ Allah has already forgiven you, why did you, why'd you give him permission? He didn't say, why did you give him permission? You should not have given him permission. By the way, I forgive you. He forgave him before he even mentioned the problem. Like you're not in any trouble at all. You are the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah mentions the forgiveness before he even mentions the issue. And even then it's not a mistake. There's that's a deeper discussion what it really counts as, but it's certainly not a mistake. What I wanted to highlight in these few examples quickly for you, or how the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is uh, honored by Allah Azza wa Jalla. Now I want to talk to you about us, our relationship with Allah and what is, what's the Messenger's role in our relationship with Allah Himself Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. A, a lot has been said on this subject, I'll just say one thing that is not commonly mentioned. The ayat of Ramadan, I think everybody hears them every Ramadan, you guys know about them. One of the ayat in the month of Ramadan is, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ There are lots of benefits in this ayah, I'll just mention one. I'll give you the English. When my slaves ask you about me. I'll repeat the English. When my slaves ask you about me. Who's you? Who's the word you referring to? Rasulullah Wasallam. When the slaves of Allah, the companions, or us, ask who about Allah? Ask Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about Allah. If you want to know about Allah, who do you have to ask? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam You're not going to get to know Allah on your own the way you will if you, get, if you ask the Messenger of Allah And look at the fa, it's called al fa sababiya fa inni qareeb Then, no doubt about it, I am near For those who go to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to learn about Allah then for those people Allah is near Think about that what position does this man have, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? 
We have to honor the messenger practically in our life. I could talk to you about what's happening politically, and I gave some comments about that in the beginning, but that's not what I want to leave you with. There are a lot of families here, mashallah. I'm very proud of the mothers that are here that are spending late night with their children, crying in their lap while their husband does nothing, except that one husband over there who's holding a child. You, you, you sir, I, I need your autograph. So, but, you know, the rest of the guys that are on vacation, first of all, make dua for these mothers that are making the sacrifice to keep, bring their kids out in this cold. For you, this is basically Antarctica right now. This is the, so cold for you. For me, this is summer vacation. Okay? But what I want to give you is how do you bring about the love of the Prophet wasallam and honoring him wasallam into your life like right now. What do you do this week? What do you do this week? Well, one of the first things is you encourage yourself and your children, especially your children, to send more and more salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. Increase that as a habit. Increase that habit of sending salawat upon the Messenger ﷺ. The second thing you can do very quickly, very immediately, is you know, you don't have to learn all the du'as because there's so many of them and you may not be able to memorize all of them. But at least learn a few of them that you can make as a family together, especially the du'as that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make regularly, like the ones for entering the home and leaving the home, or going into the bathroom, or coming out of the restroom, or changing your clothes, just a few of them. You know, or the ones, the, the adhkar before going to sleep, or the adhkar after waking up. These are small efforts. But you know what? That is how the Messenger taught us about Allah. And that is how this is, these du'as are actually a demonstration not only of our love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he's the one who taught us these, these are bringing us close to Allah also. They have that dual effect, bringing du'a into your life, bringing the masnoon du'as into your life, the du'as from the sunnah of the messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam into your life. So that's, that would be my uh, uh, recommendation inshaAllah ta'ala. Now the last part and I'm done. Okay, here we go. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have to honor him. I told you in the beginning, we are living in a time where there's an industry that makes fun of everything. And their purpose is to actually decrease our sensitivity to the subject. They want to make us less and less sensitive to the, the honor we're supposed to show to the Messenger so eventually it's not a big deal. You guys know what's happening in Hollywood. There, were, there was Noah, a movie about Nuh السلام, then recently a movie about Musa السلام, and this is just them testing the waters. You understand what I'm saying to you? They're just testing the waters. And these movies are horrible. I don't, if you've seen it, make a istighfar, boycott these films, do not watch these films. We should have nothing to do with these films. You shouldn't even learn them to know what the kuffar are saying. There's no point in you learning what the kuffar are saying. They have nothing good to say. Don't worry about it. And as a matter of fact, their account, the Hollywood version, is a, a, a deviation from the biblical version, which is twisted already. <laughs> the Bible's version is bad enough. And then they add their own chaat masala on top, and then they make these movies. And you know, movies can have a very lasting effect on people. When you watch an image one time in your head, then you know, those of you who saw Prince of Egypt, when you think of Musa alayhi the picture comes in your head, that's messed up. That's not supposed to be there. So don't, don't watch this stuff. And if a new controversy comes out about some cartoon or something else, don't go look at it. Don't go look at it. Then you, if you go look at it, you're part of the problem. No, 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 I was just looking at it to see what they do. So I can say astaghfirullah. No, you are part of the hit count. They're counting how many hits that video got. Or how many clicks this image got. And you are now counted among them. You made it popular. You know when a video becomes popular, when a, vil a video has a million hits, then the next person clicks it because it has a million hits. When it has 10 million hits, you look at it, hey, it got 10 million hits, it must be good. Must be something. If you are part of that hit count, then you are partly responsible for making it popular. We have to ignore this nonsense altogether. A dog barking cannot harm the sun. It's too high up. Let these people spit whatever they want. That cannot take anything away from the nobility of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says, رَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ We raised your mention. When Allah raises something, no creation can bring it down, people. No creation can bring it down. 
They can say whatever they want. Whatever they want. It will change nothing. It will change nothing. It will take nothing away from the nobility of our Messenger And we have to adopt the prophetic model in responding to these insults. When the Messenger would be you know, insulted and a poet would come in instead of calling him Muhammad, call him Mudhammam. He would say, he's not talking about me, it's someone else. It's someone else. This, this is not our Messenger, this is some twisted version of whatever they have in their head. You know, Al-Ina' bima fihi yandah. We cannot get so reactionary. Muslims have to show a higher level, a more sophisticated level of response to these people, to this craziness. And by the way, when we act crazy, then they turn around and say, see, we told you these people are crazy. Proved it. See? This religion, the religion of sophistication, the religion of sabr, the religion of thought, the religion that keeps asking people, afala ta'qilun, why don't you use your minds? Think, think, think. Now it's associated with the most thoughtless people. We're supposed to be a model for humanity. Let's rise to that occasion. Our Messenger والسلام, deserves it. We have to show that loyalty to him. I pray that all of us, all of us in this audience, we take responsibility for what we do in our family. If I say we have to change ourselves as an ummah, you walk away with no responsibility. Yes, ummah, I don't know where that is. You have to take responsibility for what's happening in your family. For what's happening in your family. That family, your family is your government. And when there's corruption, there's a corrupt government in your house. That's where you have to change things. If your family doesn't change, don't talk about changing the world. If you personally haven't changed, don't talk about changing the world. You're kidding yourself. You're deluding yourself. How is it that you're saying you love the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, but the way you treat your wife has nothing to do with how the Prophet treated Ummahatul Mu'mineen? How is it that you say you love the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, you want to study the entire Bukhari and the entire Muslim and you want to learn all the knowledge in the world but the way you talk to your, your kids you have no rahmah when you deal with your children the way the Messenger had rahmah when he de dealt with kids. What are you learning this for? Why are you learning it? How come it doesn't affect how you deal with your family? How come it doesn't affect how you deal with a fellow Muslim at the masjid? How come it doesn't affect the way you drive your car? There's a guy driving this way, this guy's driving that way, they're looking at each other, they go, both got beards, so they're clearly Muslim. And they're both, like, they're playing a game of chicken, like who's gonna blink? You know? And you say, could you please give me a second? And you say, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a second. <clears throat> What happened to the yu'thiruna ala anfusihim? They give preference to others over themselves. This is easy guys, this is easy. Allah is not asking us for big things. Small changes in our family life, in our personal life, in our mannerisms with others. I come to the Muslim world, first thing I notice, lack of courtesy. It's the first thing I notice, lack of courtesy. You're st I'm standing in a, it didn't happen here, but I wouldn't be surprised. It could happen anywhere. I'm standing in a Muslim country in a hotel, right, I'm about to check in. Somebody else walks in, cuts the line, Habibi, ma'lish. <laughs> this will never happen in Australia, this will never happen in England, this will never happen in America, this will never happen, any it'll happen in the Muslim world though. It'll happen here. And just a simple gesture of courtesy to your fellow human being, if we can't even do that, how are we talking about the sunnah of the most respectful, the most noble human being that ever lived? What kind of example are we? The non-Muslims who live in this country, and there are lots of them. What example do they see of the Muslims? What have they seen from the Muslims? Tell, think about that for yourself. How, what kind of behavior do they observe? Does they, when they see the behavior of the Muslims, does it make them want to be Muslim? Does it make them want to say, these people are so kind? So courteous, so patient, so respectful, so controlling of their tongue, so controlling of their eyes. They have so much love in their families. Man, I want, what do they have? Oh, they have this thing called the sunnah of their messenger. Well, I want some of that. Can I have that? Yeah, you gotta be Muslim. Or what, or what do we show them? What we show them, subhanAllah. I'm embarrassed to say, guys. I'm just embarrassed to say. We have to raise the status, our character. It has to rise. 
It has to rise. The young people in this audience, listen, I'm going to be as straightforward as I can be. Even if it gets me like in trouble, I'll just say it as, I can, as clearly as I can see it. You have a problem. The Muslim youth have a problem. They're obsessed with brands. They're obsessed with labels. They'll go into the, the, uh, the ultimate goal in your life is going to hang out in the mall. What is wrong with you? Life is a lot bigger than the mall. And what brand you're, you have to carry the bag, like the brand bag, even if you don't shop from there. You shop from there once, but you take the bag with you every time to the mall to let people know that you, you, know, you got your socks inside or something. Because you need to feel like, you know. <laughs> and if you bought a watch, you keep doing. <laughs> this is what we've reduced ourselves to? Is this what brings you nobility? Is this what brings you respect? Is this what makes you worth something? Pieces of plastic, cloth, metal, rocks. That's what they are. It's, it's stuff. It's stuff. It'll go. The thing that give, gives you respect is your Islam, is your messenger. The thing that gives you nobility is the book of Allah. What do you know about that? How much of that are you carrying? I know you're wearing a lot of brands. Let's start wearing this, this deen a little bit. Let's start wearing that. So people can, that's a brand people want to see. They haven't seen it yet. They have to see that. I pray that Allah Azza wa rises, helps this Ummah rise to the occasion. And I pray that, pray that Allah Azza wa bless the people of Qatar and make them an example for Muslims everywhere. Make, them, make their children examples for youth everywhere. May Allah Azza wa protect you and your family from the fitna that surrounds you, from the fitna that's happening all over the world. May Allah Azza wa elevate the status of the Muslims and make them uh, you know, make them live up to the responsibility left by their messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Thank you so very much for being patient. Go get some blankets. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh yeah, wait, wait. Sorry, thanks. Hey, I got an announcement. I got an announcement. I got a surprise for you. I don't know what I did with it. Hold on. Okay. So as you're leaving, can you guys show this on the screen? This is a gift I got for you from Texas. Okay. It's a, it's a gift card. Uh, I have a website called Bayina TV. It's a subscription. This is 30 days free subscription for Bayina TV. If you open it, it's not a flyer. You open it, you scratch the back, and you get access online. What it is is, I, how many people here don't know Arabic? Don't know Arabic? Okay, you're like me. Okay, good. So, if you don't know Arabic and you want to learn a little bit of Arabic, I teach my daughter about 15 minutes a day of, of Quranic Arabic. Uh, and that entire series is called Arabic with Husna. That's on this website. So you can do 15 minutes a day, maybe every two, three days, learn a little bit about the language of the Quran. Over time, it builds up. She's actually not that smart, and she can learn it, which means you can learn it. Okay, she's average, which means if a child can learn it, you can learn it, inshallah ta'ala. So these gift, car gift cards are waiting for you at the exits as you go. There are volunteers there that are passing them out. Please enjoy them, and if you do benefit from them, remember me, my family, and the entire Bayina team in your du'as. Jazakumullahu khairan, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.